You know, no, and, no, and, no, no. <laughs> Here's the thing that's beautiful about a podcast. Let it be what it is. Don't edit it. Let it be one organic being. And I'm trying. I'm trying. Because, because trying. I, I do the same thing. My first podcast, today's guest is Burt Kreischer. <laughs> you might have seen him on such shows as Trip Flip, Burt the Conqueror, Hurt Burt, uh, Life with David J with Elliot Gould, or you might have seen him on many stand-up comedy clubs. He's also written a book called Life of the Party that comes out May 27th, and we'd like to talk about that today. Yeah, yeah and, and, However, and people re- pre-order it. Then. Pre-orders. Let me tell you something. I know you have smart <laughs> listeners, at least ones that have Kindles. Right. Some most of my listeners don't have Kindles, <laughs> so please pre-order my book. Pre-orders are so important. As anyone that knows anything about books, pre-orders determine. Literally, it was told to me this way. I talked to my guy, my guy, and I was like, "I'm just so excited that my book's going to be in Barnes and Noble." Yeah. And he was like, "Well, we'll see about that." I was like, "What do you mean? You need five thousand. He's like, "You need large pre-orders in order for Barnes and Noble and and Target and all them to want to put your book in." the stores and I went I didn't know you fucking why wouldn't you tell me that at the beginning yeah. that I wouldn't I wouldn't have taken my, this short money and gotten a book I, and written for two years it took me two years to write I know, this book I know I so know. please pre-order my book Life of the Party at com. there you can choose this is also very important well and I'm also but by the way and so I'm interrupting you but, go no but why isn't there an audio version that you can pre-order because I mean you to so many people are, are audio yeah you know, it's so funny. I asked him about that. I said, I want to do, um, I'd like to do, uh, someone offered me space to to uh, tape my audio book. And he goes, man, got to be honest with you. They only do audio books if you have a hit book. Corolla, they, he, had he, an had audio, he had an audio book and a hardcover release at the same time. Really? So talk, so talk to Corolla because he actually he there's a whole thing about oh, fuck, I need right now <laughs> uh, because he had sort of a special deal worked out because they were going to pay for X amount of it and so talk to I Corolla. will I will read that book in a heartbeat if there's a way to pre order but I don't know if pre orders count for book sales oh no no just it's just I don't care about the money I don't care about the money you're moving units I don't so care about get... the money though I want what I want what I wouldn't mind is an, a book version with an audio attachment for a five five extra dollars. So people go, you know what? I'll buy it because I'm also getting the audio, and I'll just listen to the audio, and I'll get the book, and I'm Bertel sign it. All right, you, you have it all. That's a out. good idea. Let's okay. Uh, <laughs> I please text me and remind me that. All right, all right, all right. Okay, so we're backing up because you know one of the things that I think is sort of amazing about your story is the fact that you're a family man, and we talked about this and and how. Um, uh, uh, the time traveler's wife hits you particularly uh, hard because it, it's because you feel like Henry, right? Uh, entirely. Like I started watching that movie and I was in a hotel room and I, I got to be dead honest with you. Eric Bana never really connected with me. Mm. The Hulk, I just didn't see him as that guy. Mm. So I was like, I saw him and I was like, eh, I get it. Another Australian guy that doesn't talk with the accent and, and I'm going to f- be forced to try to hear the accent the entire time he acts. Right. And then... I, and then and then I realized, oh my god, he actually is time traveling. I didn't know. I didn't I, like. I really. I was like, okay, this is really about time travel, and I'm obsessed with time travel. <laughs> I am obsessed with time travel because I have a fear of death. I think that's why I'm obsessed with time travel. Anyone who has a fear of of just disappearing wants to know that maybe I can go back and keep reliving those great days over and over again. Sure. Um, to Quantum Leap was like me and my dad's show. I watched every episode of Quantum Leap, and I can tell you where I was when I watched the finale in New York on my couch across the street from the Comedy Cellar, and I was bawling, crying, going, it's over! It's <laughs> I got all the answers I needed! I love finality. I love answers. But did you like that finale? Like, that is a very controversial finale. What? The time, what? Qu- Quantum Leap. Uh, yes, yes, I loved it. I loved it. The him fact the, that he never goes home? home? Yeah, yes! Well, I love are it! You Keep time traveling! traveling. <laughs> you get to live forever! I love that! Live forever! So the time traveler's wife, and I, and I have gotten much better about this because, and I hope Aud- Audrey is listening, I hope she's I'll like, you know, her, yeah. yeah, send her this to Audrey her. Audrey Nifenegger, the uh, author. And, and I know she's, I can guarantee you she's a real writer. She is a actual writer. And I guarantee you the fact that I'm talking about the movie is probably making her livid. <laughs> she's like, I'm sorry, I wrote a fucking book. Why didn't you read that when it was out and it was a national bestseller? <laughs> but the, the um, she'll watch the, the she'll watch your, yeah. she'll watch the movie version of your book. So it'll, yeah. it'll, it'll, it'll all even out. It'll be fine. <laughs> She's like, I saw Van Wilder. This guy didn't say anything. It's not anything <laughs> like him. So, uh, so by the way, I hate that Van Wilder. Anyway, let's let's just get back. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, so yeah. So when I started watching the movie, I was like, I love it. I love connecting the pieces. I love that he shows up to the wedding and he's got gray hair and she sees it and she's like, Oh my god! But the more importantly, and I think this mostly has to do with, and I wrote a bit based on this that I didn't know the connection. I didn't know that uh, having children was going to be such a commitment. Mm-hmm. 
because the connection you have with your children far extends just you hanging out with them and spending time with them. It, it, it creeps into your everyday life. And when he comes out of the woods that last time and he sees her and she says, Mommy, he's, I'm going to cry. If Tony wasn't in the room, I'd start crying. I swear <laughs> to God. When she says, Mommy's here, I feel like that. I feel like that so often. And so often I'm gone and I'm missing large parts of my family's life when she's upset and she's in the room and she hasn't seen him in like a month and he just shows up. That is my life. And I connected so deeply with that. And that last moment when she's like, mommy's here. And then she runs and he just, I'm going to, I'm going to start fucking crying. (laughs) I cried so hard and I was sitting on a corner of a bed naked and I was sobbing uncontrollably. I was like, this is the greatest fucking movie I've ever seen. And then the next day I I, I went in and do radio. I think the next day I want to say I was in Columbus and I said, have you guys seen The Time Traveler's Wife? And they made fun of me because that's not a, like a dude. No. I'm like a fight club looking guy. Yeah, yeah. 300, have you seen the new 300? So, but, and they were like, The Time Traveler's Wife. And I started talking about it and I started crying. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't stop crying because it was like such a great, it's so great. Do you know what, here's what even better is a guy who wrote a book and, and knowing how hard it is to write. Writing is so much harder than I ever thought it would be. And I, you know, but what, what, what I would like to see, what I would like to know from Audrey was, did she know that that's how it would end before it ended that way? Mm-hmm. And when she wrote it, when she wrote that end scene of him coming out of the woods, the clothes are waiting for him. He doesn't know what's going on. He's a little confused. And he gets to see his daughter. And and the fact that his fucking daughter gets to travel in time and spend time with him. Oh, my God. Like, like did she get it? And it's like unraveling a necklace where you're like, I got it. I fucking got it. I did it. It is w- literally, and I say this, are you ready for this? This is going to sound, um, this is going to turn me into such a mouth breathing moron right now. The greatest piece of art I've ever witnessed since hmm. Tools Prison Sex. Tools Prison Sex fucking took it to the next level <laughs> for me. Say, that, that's the first time Prison Sex and the Try and Travelish Wife have been ever sort of compared. Dude, I sat in a car, I sat in my Jetta listening to Prison Sex over and over again going, Oh my God! If I ever get to meet uh, freaking Maynard James, Keenan. Maynard James Keenan, I'm going to ask him the cycl the cyc- cyclality cyc- yeah this, of this cyclical song nature cyclical nature of this song is mind blowing. I mean, I would sit and listen to that over and over again, just going how how did he how did he come up with this? Like how did he write this? Do you start writing something like that? Like it's it just blows me away. I'm um, well, but now you're sort of deeper into the uh, sort of creative process. So I think you you know that, and I, you know I just listened to you on um, Kill Tony, and 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 listening to you just you know deconstruct uh, jokes like that. Like- that was thank you. But you know what? I really liked that podcast. I loved that podcast that I did, and I, and I I liked it also because I was with. And Tony and I know each other. I, I say Tony and I are friends. We are, but we're not like. But we don't like, we don't hang out a ton, and he's much younger than I am. So it's like it's like you know we are. You know, we are, we are, we hang out, we talk, we shoot the shit, but like, we don't, me and him don't go and like do dinner with our families together because he doesn't have a family. He's a single dude. Um, Brian, I've known, Brian's more my age, and Brian, I've known for a, a while through Joe. And Brian, I consider like definitely a, a good friend. Uh, in, in, but, but still, you know, but, but close. I'm close to Brian and I'm cl- really close to Tommy Buns. He's like one of my, he is my, maybe my top five best friends. Sure. So there was a very freeing feeling to, t- to deconstruct comedy around those guys. I didn't – like if it was Marin and Doug Benson, I would not be as comfortable. And I love – those guys are friends, but I just don't – I don't have that – I wouldn't be comfortable around Joe even. And Joe's a fr- an actual friend of mine right. because I'm – but I, around those guys, I felt very comfortable. And I love deconstructing comedy. Well, and, and I'm noticing this uh, – and, and again, I've, I've known your, your work for a, a, a little while – is you are sort of getting more uh, introspective um, and more sort of process oriented, um, and uh, you know even you know you you I think you've had this uh, uh, this public persona as the machine, yeah, and you know uh, very tied to, to to booze and you know uh, the America America's what number one party animal is yeah. that what Rolling yeah. Stone calls you. But it's so fascinating to be to watch you like you know deal with fatherhood and cheating at Candyland. <laughs> and just uh, you know, I, I've been listening to you, you know, talk about Tony. I was I was playing Candyland with Isla, and I caught her cheating. And part of me was like, "Fuck it, who do you think you're fooling? I'm your dad. I'm not." She would take Princess uh, Princess uh, Frostina, and she'd put him on top, like the very top one. And then she'd go, she go. Princess Frostina is like at the very end of the line, and she go, "Okay, you ready to play, Dad? I'll go first. I go, "No." I'll go first. And she goes, no. You can see the panic in her eyes. No. And in my head, I wanted to teach her. Put it like four in. I'm never going to catch four in. 
And so I busted her, and then I had to play the full game with her, and I realized, I don't want to play the fucking full game. Why don't I just let her cheat and win and go, all right, looks like we're done Candyland. <laughs> Isla has been I've, – I've exp- my, po- my podcast has changed my dialogue with the audience entirely, I think entirely. But, but with yourself. I mean, I oh, know, with I, me. Because, yeah, I'm much more introspective than I ever have been. Well, and I've noticed this with, uh, you know, Marin as well, because, like, the first hundred episodes of that podcast was him apologizing to people. Yeah. Now he's run out of people to apologize to. And it's sort of interesting because he's having to sort of, you know, look uh, inward more. And, and you know, I used to be one of those, like, bad podcast listeners where I would I would for- fast forward past the first 15 minutes. Oh, which I is... still do. <laughs> but the thing is, like, when oh. he was going through his drama, like, with his girlfriend and then fiance, yeah. like, I tuned in for that. That's what a uh, bad person I <laughs> Can I tell you? Can I tell you no. that I just listened to, he's now dating Moon, Moon Zappa. Zappa. Yeah. And I fucking almost texted him and told him. I love this Moon Zappa stuff. It's I like love a soap hearing, opera. I love hearing about him and her going to dinner with his with uh, yeah. his her daughter right. and her daughter's like my mom's got a crush. I loved hearing that because I can see Mark in that situation, and I think that's why I like his sitcom because I can see him in that situation, and it's a and 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 it's it it in so many ways is so Mark and and and. And he's he's he'll be is he coming out to Chicago? You should have him on the podcast. Yeah, he's he, he's always he's around. so fucking interesting. Well, and, and so one of the things I want to ask you, like, I really want to get to this thing with you know you're traveling. So you not only do you tour, but you know you have this show on Trip Flip, mm-hmm. uh, on Travel Channel called Trip Flip. Um, I just what does that do to you? Because I mean, are you on the road like forty five weeks a year? <laughs> yeah, I'm on the road a lot. I mean, is is your brain just constantly trying to catch up? Like, what what is it like? What what are the effects of that? Well, I think I think there's part of it where you become numb to it. I, I explained this to someone who was, uh, I don't know where to start, but I will tell you, being around me for on tour is gr- grueling. Like I'm, I do, I have, I consistently. As my daughter says, go hard in the fucking paint. Like I is that a direct it's, quote? It's Isla, Isla, <laughs> Isla listened to Isla listened to a couple hip hop lo- lyrics. I'm sure you heard this one. She said uh, I, the other day. I said something. I forget the analogy, but I said something. We should do that. And Isla just looked at me as I got a pocket full of do the damn thing money. <laughs> I said, <laughs> where did you hear that? She goes, your music. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so sh- being around you on tour. Being around me on tour is grueling. So a lot of what happens is. A lot of the people on tour with me with Trip Flip, they start to come apart at the seams after like five weeks in. And you can see them kind of being like, uh, so we're going to dinner every night together. And we're all going to hang out in the bar at the hotel lobby every night. And we're getting up at six in the morning. And how come you're at the gym? And, and like I'm definitely up at the gym. I'm working out. I'm I'm drinking late at night. I'm trying to, I, I, because I'm lonely. And then I explained to someone very candidly. I didn't realize what I said. I said, oh, you just got to have two personalities. You got to have the road you and then you got to have the family you. Right. Because when you go home, I, I turn it off almost entirely. But it takes, there's, if I've been on the road for a long time, especially out of the country, it takes like a two day grace period right. to like get me back. But once I'm back, it's, it's no booze. It's, it's playing softball with the girls. Unless like I do like, you know, an Ice House Chronicles or I go hang out with friends and sure. we'll go out drinking. But like for the most part, it's like straight up dad. And they were, and my wife's like, that's really unhealthy for you to have two personalities. Right. And I was like, really? She's like, yes, it's very unhealthy. <laughs> and so, but I told them, I said, you just got to turn off. The part of you that misses your kids, and it shows up. It rears its head every now and then. But you got to turn off that person and just be the guy on. It's almost like I don't have a family sometimes, like because you got to do dangerous stuff, you know. And and when you do something dangerous, you just got to go. I'm gonna get through it. I'm gonna live through it. It's not that bad. My kids are gonna have a dad. But because if you start thinking about that, you'll lose your fucking mind. Well, and and uh, just for listeners who who might not know, uh, you know, some of your exploits. I mean, so so you know, you've had a, a bunch of shows named after you. You know, Hurt Bert, uh, Bert the Conqueror, basically where you you know fight a bear, rodeo clown, jump out of a plane, sort of all. I was the first person to jump off the stratosphere, and that was the first time that it really hit me where I went, okay. I remember laying in bed going, I'm a dad. I love my kids. That's all I fuck. All I want to do is hang out with my kids and and have a glass of wine at the end of the night and watch the sunset with my wife in the backyard as the kids are on the trampoline. That's all I want. And I went, I'm not doing that. What I'm doing, I remember I remember laying in bed going, thinking, very honestly, I've made a lot of poor decisions in my life and I've made them all because I've been drinking for every major decision I've ever made. Right. And I was like, this is a mistake. And I was like, I'm going to run away. I was throwing up in the bathtub at the time. I was like, I was losing it. I was spiraling. I called my wife and I was like, I'm running away. I'm going to go to the desert and you can grab, t- don't tell anyone where I am. Uh, but I'm not going to jump off the stratosphere. My wife's like, you're going to be fine. Two things. She said, you're going to be fine and don't 
run away because we we're going to sue us for the production costs. <laughs> she was like, <laughs> you're practical. Yeah. And so I, I got through it. And I remember coming home the next day uh, and I told the girls that I jumped off the stratosphere and I showed them the video and they were like, their eyes like lit up. And I was like, okay. So now I compartmentalize those fears that I have. And I have them a lot. Like I, I won't, I won't go hang gliding. I, I don't trust hang gliding. Right. I've never trusted hang gliding. It's really dangerous. We actually had a hang gliding accident on our show one time. So, uh, semi, no one got hurt, yeah, but it was like, it was enough to scare the crap out of me. Yeah. yeah usually there are hang gliding accidents. There's hang gliding and then fatalities. Yeah. No, this yeah. was a, this was a bump in hang gliding. And I saw that and I was like, I'll never go. Yeah. Um, so, but, and I, I deal with the the fear a little better than I used to, and I also um, uh, kind of I, I'm really good at judging the safety of an activity, and I think that's simply by being quote unquote a stunt man for the past seven years, eight years, ten years. I mean, we went to stunt school in Paris, France, where we had to do a, 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 a four story dive into an airbag, which is pretty fucking intense. Four stories, like go go stand on a four, double your house by four, and jump off it into a bag. Now, granted, the bag is a solid half a sto- story and a half, right? So, but it's full of air. But it's full of air, and. I just got up there and I got up there and I was like, it's not that bad. I was like, and I kind of, we have full stuntmen with us, my travelers, but I need to let them know that if I'm doing it, you can do it. If I don't do it, meh, maybe, maybe keep an eye out, but <laughs> like I'm doing it and I go, it's super easy. All you got to do is just jump. It's like landing on your back in the pool. It feels unnatural, but it's the safest way to do it. And I did it and I landed perfect and I got done and the head of the stunt school was like, you know, have you ever thought about being a stuntman? I was like, no. And he's like, well, you, you're very natural. You're very natural at this. And I was like, in my head, I was like, well, I've done this a lot. Like, and so technically I am, uh, I think I, I, I coined the, the phrase, I am a, uh, I have a competitive eater's body and a, an extreme athlete's lifestyle. So yeah. <laughs> well, and, 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 uh, Again, just from listening to the podcast, I hear that you're you're trying to change some of those behaviors, especially how you go to sleep. How are oh, how are you sleeping? Dude. No, I can, and this is when I don't want Tony in the room. But like, <laughs> but by the way, in the room is Tony Baldino. He is the owner of the Schomburg, the Chicago Improv. It's out in Schomburg. It is a great club. It is huge. If you ever want to see a theater act in an intimate setting, that's where you go see and, it. And by the way, we uh, Bert uh, uh, was was good enough to in, uh, interrupt my intro. But you're there tonight, uh, March 14th, and tomorrow night. Yeah. Um, uh, March fifteenth. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, Chicago.improv.com. So what was the question? Uh, it, oh, going to sleep. Yeah. I used to. Um, I used to kind of have to uh, medicate myself to sleep. Right. Like drink, have a bottle of wine, and then I go to sleep. Um, on the nights I didn't drink, I'd take like half a Xanax to get to sleep, or I'd take Nyquil. Like I could not lay in bed because the second I laid in bed, my brain would go crazy, and I would just be like, and I and I would start. Thinking. I mean, since I was a kid, so it's where I got anxiety. I just lay in bed, and my brain would start thinking. I remember one time I was a kid, and I heard the word horse, and I was like, "Where did that come from?" And I was like, "Holy fuck! I have no control over this," and it terrified me. And so I've always gone to bed somehow uh, lubricated. And recently, and I don't know what it was. I don't know what the change was, but I just was like, "I'm tired of this." I'm like, "I'm tired of the fact that I can't." Like, it blew my mind to think that people really actually say to everyone good night and then put their head on a pillow and go i and choose to go to bed no no go, no I have, I have a little boy like my little girl is up doing stuff for an hour after she yeah. <laughs> after she's put to bed he is out yeah like what what i wouldn't give for that yeah the ability to but it's it's all based on my parents my parents never let me never gave me a bedtime so mm-hmm. i would stay up until midnight because i was like how do you fall asleep like i just i didn't know i never learned how to fall asleep i never and i andy woodhull um so I, but I would just lay there and go, how do I get to bed? And I never learned how to do it. And then recently, and I say recently, you probably know the exact date because I, I'm sure I talked about it on my podcast, but recently within the last couple months, I just started going, I'm so tired of this. Why can't I just be a grown up who goes to bed? And so I'd get in bed, no TV, right? That's the other thing is TV is, yeah. I've turned on TV and I just watch TV and then I'm up. So no TV, lay in bed and put my head on the pillow and just close my eyes and start relaxing. And then I'd fall asleep. <laughs> that sounds so crazy. But but, but, is, but is part of the that that influence uh, Leanne. Uh, I mean, because no, I, Leanne's fucking dead inside. <laughs> She's dead inside. She does not get any of my personal quirks at all. She is like, I don't get it. How come you can't just go to sleep? Aren't you tired? You had a long day, honey. I made her sound. I don't know what I made her sound like, but that was pretty good. Yeah, she, yeah that was pretty good. I, the joke I say on stage now is she's got her accent so redneck. When she talks, you smell biscuit. <laughs> so, uh, she, but yeah, she does not get any of it. She doesn't get like, she had this, uh, this like bump on her arm and I was like, what is that? She's like, I don't know. 
I was like, don't, aren't you nervous about it? She's like, nah. I go, what, what if it's cancer or something? It's like a dry patch, like scaly dry patch yeah. bump. I go, what if it's cancer? She goes, it's probably not. And I was like, huh, I wish I could have that brain. <laughs> I fucking love that brain. I'm in the Pittsburgh Improv last week and I saw something on my face and I spiraled and I was spiraling on stage and I could not turn the spiraler around. And I'm like, ah. Well, the, the, the uh, and again, I'm going to get far too personal here. No, please, uh, but, I don't but, care. But, but I've noticed like, in seriously, in the last two podcasts, like it, it's the first time I've ever heard you say like, Oh yeah, I have a problem. You know, like like I you oh, know yeah. like if I if I didn't have kids or something, you know, like if I didn't do this, I would be sober already. So my question to you is like, is, is that the goal? Because you know, again, no. drinking is so part of your stage the persona. Goal, the goal is the my goal, and I've stated this ever since I was like like twenty two, is to always be able to enjoy a margarita at sunset on a beach. Always, that's my goal. I think what has happened is, uh, the older you get. I started. I'm, I'm sure I talked about this. If I haven't, we will talk about it now. But uh, I've been um, waking up with anxiety attacks at four in the morning mm. a lot lately, and so I will, I will just start panicking and thinking about mortality and how short life is, and and what if I get MS? What not, can guys get MS? Yeah. Okay, what if I get MS? Um, what if I get Parkinson's? What if I get Lou Gehrig's disease? Like that is that can really happen. Yep, People Bill, really Bill, get that. Billy Billy Connolly just uh, diagnosed with Parkinson's. Really? Yeah. And so I started like, and I think. I think what happened is I just started um, looking at just life a little differently in this. And I think it's called growing up a tad bit. I mean, you think about it. I am a 41-year-old child. I never really had to do anything. I never really had a job in my life. I had a job at Barnes & Noble. I worked in my dad's office, but that's technically it. I folded sweaters once. So, but like, so I think you start realizing, okay, my goal is not sobriety. My goal is happiness. Mm -hmm. And I think that what happens is, and, and definitely when I get on the road, the wheels come off a tad bit. And I like, I don't mind it. I have fun. Like, I'm looking forward to having drinks tonight at the, at the, at the improv. But but I can promise you Sunday morning, I will be looking forward to I will be looking forward to dinner with my family and and playing softball with the girls when the sun sets, as opposed to drinks. It's just you look forward to different things differently. Um, but the thing, the reason, the whole reason I'm asking yeah. this is, you know, how how many episodes are you up to in your podcast? Sixty five, yeah. I think. So, but it's the first time in you know sixty three episodes that you've ever sort of. Uh, declared, you know, your sort of party life almost not as an impediment to yeah. long-term happy, happiness, but like that, that sort of like insightful process. Watching you go through that is really, really interesting hmm. because specifically about um, uh, falling asleep. You're like, wait, this is an impediment from for me. Oh, you know, my biggest impediment right now is flying. Yeah, I wish I. I I'm telling you, and I say this wholeheartedly, I'm, I believe in God and whatnot, but I would accept Jesus Christ into my heart as my Savior and go to church every Wednesday and Sunday and, and, and tied money to the church if I could just fly sober. I cannot do it. I've tried so many times. And ever, like, I had one flight. I don't, I don't know what was my – it's like I do small goals. It was very, by the way, I'm getting very honest and very personal, but I do small goals. My big goal was to not drink on the car ride to the airport. That was like a big goal that I set for myself and I've accomplished, eh, except for yesterday. But I've accomplished it for the most part. I don't drink on my way to the airport. And then my goal was to not drink at the airport, to just drink, have my first drink on the plane and earn that drink on the plane. And so I did that for like the first three, two months of this year. And I was really proud of myself. But then I got, I fucking had to fly to Bogota. And I was like, who flies to Bogota sober? <laughs> I, got, pilots. I, got shit faced. Pilots. I got shit faced <laughs> in the afternoon at the hotel in Costa Rica, knowing I'm going to fucking Bogota. And then in Bogota, I was a mess. I was, a, I was like pouring them down my throat because I'm like, I got to fly out of fucking Bogota. And then you go into Rio. That's another seven-hour flight. And then I'm in Rio, and then you got to fly home. And by the way, those those drinking on that that. You you were paying for that in in spades the next week, yeah. so so that's where the wheels came off on this little uh, adventure. But like but like I flew to I had to fly to San Jose one afternoon to do a speaking engagement for Travel Channel and then fly back. Now I'm clearly not going to drink to go work for Travel, and and I was and I would never have done it if the SVP of the network hadn't called me personally and said I need you at this engagement. I need you to speak. And so, and I had a show in Irvine that night. So I got on a plane and I flew sober. And I, at one point, I started crying, laughing at myself at how comical I, my fears are. And I was like, everyone, I'm looking at a guy drinking coffee. And I'm like, how the, 
How do you do that? Well, the, the, the other thing I want to know is just like, how, how do people know when you're crying? Because your laugh is- I have sunglasses. The, I have sunglasses on. <laughs> I had sunglasses on and a hoodie. And I started crying, <laughs> laughing at myself, going, what is wrong with me? Why can't I just, it is a 45 minute flight. Why can't for 45 minutes, I just realize I'm not going to die. But I go, that's when you die. That's when you die. <laughs> it's when you don't expect it. And that's when the, the one time I don't drink, that's the time I go down. And so I started like, I started sp- spiraling bad then i land and i see anna my contact and all and she's like how was the flight i was like in my head i'm like and i got two shows in irvine that night and i was like i'm fucking drinking for the next flight i don't give a shit my shows in irvine suffer they suffer but i i got done the speaking engagement went straight to the airport had a beer got on the plane had a a double jack on the rocks which by the way i spilt on myself so now i reek of alcohol (laughs) my wife comes to the show she sees me she's like i thought you weren't drinking for flights i was like that's done (laughs) but yeah that's my next goal my next goal And, and jen kirkman was on my podcast she was like i can get you through it Right. But, I mean, it's, it's it's really interesting. Because I, I think I don't know if she told you this, but I think somebody told you this. But something to the to the effect of is like you are going to be an amazing sober comic. But for me, I was like, oh, that that's that's that, you know, for me, that is sort of like no. The thing that is really interesting is this, like this yeah. process well, of, here's you, the other, of you here's being the other, vulnerable. Here is the other part: is that I, that I think my dr- I I think I, I let let me rephrase this. I think I have highly exaggerated my own. Uh, uh, legend simply to uh, to get to where I am today. And then once you get there, you're like, motherfucker, like, I don't really drink that much. Mm. Like, and then everyone's like, no, like, I mean, I, like, this is a perfect example. I, I, I'm sure, I don't know if I told, if, if you've heard this or not, but I will tell you again if you have. I went to drop off my kids one morning and I, I drop off and we have Monday morning assembly, which is really like long. I'm sure you've heard this. And I grabbed two Diet Cokes and I put them in my jacket pocket because I'm going to need some caffeine to get through this. And I'm hungover. I get to Monday morning assembly. I crack my first Diet Coke open and realize I have a Coors Light. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm playing into this legend I've created for myself, <laughs> which, which by the way, I've earned. Yeah. But it was like, it was like, I wanted to be like a tell. A tell was such a, like a legend to me in like, you never knew what he did when he left the club. And he was, he, and, and, and like people would have a drinking story with a talent. It was just like great. And I liked that. And I liked the, 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 the Jim Belushi's and the, and the, <laughs> the Jim Belushi's. Are you just going to rattle off dead guys? No. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Chris Farley's. I love those guys. Yeah. Greg Giraldo, Patrice. I love that legend of that. And so I kind of, you know, and, and a part of it's being a young comic and wanting to perpetuate, wanting to get into clubs and get radio people to listen yeah. to you. It's like one thing I really regret is, and I and I don't regret it entirely, but I wish I'd never brought up the Van Wilder shit. Yeah. Like I, and I needed to at the time because it was a great way to get radio stations that did not want me on in. And I could talk about it real quick, and I have no connection to it. I didn't write the book, the screenplay, right? And and just to back up for audiences who might not who might not know, there's a circuitous route, circuitous route in which uh, uh, Van Wilder was loosely inspired by your college experience at Florida State. That is the most brilliant way to say it. However, yeah. if you say that on radio, and you're 30 years old, no one listens, right? But if you say the movie Van Wilder is based on my life, bam, shut up, right? We got the real Van Wilder, the real Van Wilder, and so like. Even like saying that, I like I, they did it today. The intro for the t- TV show we did was like a clip from Van Wilder, and I was like, I have nothing to do with that. Right? Like it's so not me. But, but again, that, that's what makes you fascinating is you have built this legend that you are in the process of climbing out of, and and like how aware. Are... <laughs> yeah, cl- I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I don't know if I'm trying to climb. Here's the thing. It's like it's like we just did develop a sitcom, and they were like, and it, that question in- entirely encompasses. What the query of the sitcom, what the query of the executives were, was like, well, what's going on with Bert? Does he not want to be this guy or does he want to be this guy? And I'm like, look, he's always going to be, like, because we're talking about me in the third person. I was like, he's always going to be this guy, but he is a grown up and he does understand that this, you can't be this guy forever. However, I can always be a little bit of that guy. That, that guy's always going to be there. I just don't know. And it's like, it's like the Russian mob story. It's like, it's like, dude. It happened so long ago right. that even when I tell it now, I just feel like I feel like I'm telling it about somebody else. Right. It was like 25 years ago, no, 20, 19 years ago. Right, and and again, robbed a train with the Russian. Mafia. When I was in college, I was I was involved with the Russian mafia, and we robbed a train. Right, right, and which is where you get the nickname the the machine. Yes, and and so, but this is I I want to come back to to your book because this is fascinating to me. So, you know, the process of writing that book, um, part of it is a little bit of exorcism because all those stories go out. I watched this Tony happen. and I were talking about this today in the car because yeah. I was like I was like okay I've got I've told all my stories. These are all my really great stories. Right, all of them. 
So now, you know, David Sedaris even did this. Like, he told all of his great family stories, and then he forces himself to move to France. So he has something else to write about. So my question for you is, like, do you realize that that is sort of the exorcism, the sort of clearing out of your past, and do you have a plan for Act 2? Yes. <laughs> That's the short answer, yes. <laughs> Yes. But, but, but again, like... What, it, I mean, luckily, luckily, I'm blessed to have a job at Travel Channel, which I value very much. And I, and I love my relationship with the network. I love my relationship with scripts, the owners. I love everything about it. And so, luckily, I'm blessed enough to literally go on the adventures of a lifetime every month for two weeks. Every month that I'm around for the next three years, I'll be going on adventures of a lifetime that... Could I mean that's like I'm I'm talking to Travel Channel right now about possibly writing a book about my experiences at Travel Channel, which would be I mean which I could write three books, I could right. write four books, but I have a I have a, I talked to Tony about it today, and I've had this plan on what where the where my future goes, my second act of life, and so hopefully. I'll be able to accomplish it. Hopefully, I won't just flake on it and just not do it and then just do the road and be happy making money on the road. Hopefully, I'll do – I'll focus on it and accomplish it, and it'll be my my second act. Not my third act. I guess third act is like when you're like – I don't know. I don't know. But, 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 but the thing the, – you know, again, I'm interested in when – you know, when you stop telling the machine story, like after that, oh, fucking I, never, I, never, I, I, never, no, no, never, no, no, I will never stop telling that story. But, but, but at a certain point, like uh, George Carlin didn't do the hippy dippy weatherman. At a certain point, like you know, he had enough material. Okay, but here's the question, right? Say you go to a George Carlin show, like right before he passed. I did. And say he goes, guys, I haven't done this in a while, but hey, man, like you, everyone would go, shut up. See, We're getting to see Carlin see, do it. And I don't think so because by then he had a different generation of fans that didn't know that material. Yeah, yeah, but he it would, didn't like he didn't drag it around. It was not his dynamite. I'll tell you what, I I I did I did um I did some club for like the third time and since I've been telling this story. And I I was like, I'm not gonna tell it. It was uh Columbus. It was right. a third show, the late show third on Saturday, three shows on Saturday, and I ch- I'd say I'm not going to do it. I don't do it. And at the end of the show, there are 15 people waiting at the bar, and Dave's troop comes up to me and goes, why didn't you tell the story, dude? They're upset. They want their money back. I was like, what? And he was like, they drove from Columbus, from from Sandusky to Columbus to come see you tell that story. I was like, are you kidding me? He's like, they're, they're really upset. You might want to talk to them. I go out, and they're like, dude, we came to see the story. And I was like, yeah, I know, but I've told them. They go, we haven't heard it. And I was like, yeah, and it's the same thing that I talked about with Tosh one time is that until you until I am George Carlin, I'll be telling that story every single show because people hear it online and then they bring their friends and they want to hear me tell it live. And when I tell it live, it's a lot better than the one they heard sure, online. Sure. And it's and it's and it's and it's got more energy and pizzazz, but I I don't I can't imagine myself I, but w- when is the cutoff? Because uh, again, when you, know, tell, you tell me. No, no, that because the, again, I'm watching you go through this journey. You know, at a certain point, you know, Radiohead no longer plays Creep. Yeah, but I <laughs> want to see. I want to hear them play Creep because I've never seen them live. <laughs> and if I go see them live, I want to hear Creep. Yeah, I want to hear Creep. But, but the, how great would it he- be to hear Creep acoustic? I don't give a shit. But what if Creep is nine minutes long? Uh, the, the machine's <laughs> nine minutes long. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that that's that's my that's my question. Um. All right, so so um, a, a couple of little things I want to wrap up with, and sure. that is, uh, I know you've uh, talked about developing a, a sitcom. So where are you with that? Are you filming that? Is I'm in. Development? I'm development? in redevelopment right now. Okay. So I'm back. I'm in development again. Uh, NBC passed on it. It was shopped. It's it's at other networks right now. However, I've signed up to do another development season with CBS Productions and Eric Tenenbaum. Okay. And uh, uh, is Trip Flip, are you literally doing that for three years? I'm doing that. I'll be doing that. Hopefully, if I'm lucky, I'll be doing that until I'm – for the next 20. I'd okay. like to be the Bobby Flay of Travel Channel and just keep working there. Always, always have an overall deal there. Always – I would like to be – I would like to be writing my fourth book, have a sitcom, four-camera sitcom that shoots, and be doing Trip Flip once a week every month. Mm-hmm. I would like that's the show is a blessing. It is the sh- the d- best job you could ever have, and I will never leave Travel Channel. The that company has given me everything that I have in my life right now, that that provides my family with stability. They've given it to me, and I will be forever grateful. And it, I will work for them as long as they want me to work for them. But the tension of that is you get to feel like Henry. You know, yeah. so, so so it's all time traveler's wife. So is there any tension at all? I know you have these goals. I know you want to provide for your family, but some of that, like. At what cost? Um, I wouldn't mind scaling it back. That's why I would like the sitcom, four camera sitcom, and uh, and but I, you know, 
I don't know. It's like even when I stay home for a little bit, I start getting antsy and being like, being like, well, what about the what about the road? Like I I mean like like I like I wasn't on the road t- uh, two weeks ago. I was off the road and I was like, and then I was like, Ari Shafir's in Edmonton. Shit, I want to be in Edmonton. I was like, God, I miss Edmonton. And then you find yourself calling your agent. And you're like, Hey, what's uh, what's like? It's you, you. It's it. It becomes part of who you are, and you want to be on the road. And you wanna, you want. I love doing stand up. I love writing jokes. You write a joke, and you're like, I gotta get on stage and perform it. I need to do that. Um. So and 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 writing a book doesn't have that kind of initial payoff. And I don't even know if it's ever gonna have that payoff at all. I mean, the only payoff is getting the book deal. It's a one inch thick business card. <laughs> it's good. I, 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 I say that with all seriousness, but it opens doors you could never even well, let's imagine. hope I can fit them in my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my book. <laughs> so I think what we've learned today is buy my book, Life of the Party at Bert, Bert, pre-order, Bert.com. Pre-order. pre-order my book. <laughs> Please pre-order my book. And come see me in Chicago. Uh, if you're going to hear this, you're posting this today? I'm posting this yeah. like as soon as you leave. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Tweet it and I'll, I'll retweet it and yeah. and hopefully – and we'll see your outreach. Yeah, I was going to say, this is the uh, big pod <laughs> – this is the Big Questions podcast. It's part of the Sometimes Media Local Network podcast. Our music is by Hernan Sanchez. Uh, Can I tell you the, the only thing – I keep thinking of Fletch when I'm in here. Like this is what I thought life would be like working at because I wanted to be Fletch uh-huh. and I thought I'd walk in and I I don't see the 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 crazy editor that's Fletch what a, I, I don't I, see I any of the you. chaos I can introduce you <laughs> I don't see any of the chaos that I thought would be a newspaper I see a lot more computers no typewriters no one's drinking coffee smoking cigars no one's got that hat with the press thing in yeah, it it's, ni- it's not 1950 that's the I, problem <laughs> I guess things things grew also, up there are also more women around here as well yeah in in executive jobs what's up with that. <laughs> The times they have changed. <laughs> I went to. A, I, dude, this is the last thing I'm gonna say. There's a. Um, there's like a very she she. There's a very she she. Uh, like club. I don't know. I don't know the point of it. Um, it's like a club in Chicago. In, in, you know, in LA, it's called like the Soho Club or something. Sure. It's like. Like a, ten thousand dollars to join, and you can go have cocktails. Where to store and, your mitzvah? Yeah, and it's like mistress. all old. Uh, bi- it's in the top of a building, and it's all old leather chairs and uh, pool tables. And I, some guy, my agents, set up a meeting with some guy who wanted to pitch a, sh- a movie to me or a show. And I was like, okay. And I walked in, and can I tell you the? And I and I hate that I said that I said this. I walked in, the girl at the front like takes my name, and I go, okay. I go upstairs, and there are women there, and I went, whoa. I thought this was like a private club. And he's like, yeah, they let women in. I was like, oh, I just assumed that it would be all men. Like, right. I assumed it would be like old school. Boys club. Yeah, like a boys club. And he's like, no, 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 no. It's 2013. <laughs> there are women can join just like men. I was like, ah, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you see the enlightening guy I am. <laughs> well, no, this is, this is why I asked how people know the difference between you laugh or you cry. Because oh. <laughs> Oh, I really appreciate you doing this. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, w- yeah. I would have stayed for two hours. No, we have one right. more radio right. interview. I appreciate, it. I appreciate it. Post it today. I'll retweet it. God bless America. Uh-huh. What do we What do we learn today, everybody? Say it together. Pre-order Bert's <laughs> book. Life of the party. Don't even read it. I don't give a shit if you read it. I don't just use it as a business card. Cut it up in little pieces. Write your name on it. and Give it out to friends. I just want you to pre-order it. I just want to be on the New York Times bestseller list. Our sponsor is Sure. Uh, uh, sure. S H U R E dot com. Sure. Thank you again for. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you. Bye. Bye.